Before we read God's word together from Ephesians 3, uh, let's ask that the Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds and would use the preaching and the hearing of God's word for the blessing of God's people and the growth of God's kingdom. Father, this morning we come to your word. It is an everlasting word. It is a divinely inspired and revealed truth from yourself, of yourself. And Father, this morning we pray that you would grant us by your grace in Jesus Christ through the work of your Holy Spirit that what we do not know or understand of the truth that you would teach us in Jesus Christ, that what we do not have of the blessing of God which is secured for us by Christ that you would give to us, and that what we are not yet in the image of Jesus Christ, by the work of your Holy Spirit, you would make us, Father. Guide the preaching of the word that it would be your words and your voice, your truth that reaches our ears and our hearts. And guide us as we hear your word and receive it as it is in truth, the word of God for the people of God. Work in us now, we pray. Send your spirit among us to move in us and to change us that we may be more like the one who died to redeem us. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 1 and read through verse 13. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ, Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery, hidden for ages in God, who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. <clears throat> Note here that these words at the beginning of the chapter are for this reason. That, that's a connection to something that's already been said. And so at this point, it might be worthwhile to take just a moment to kind of recap where we've been so far. We, we've been sort of trotting along and being careful, um, taking small steps, but by no means even exhausting all the things that one could learn from this passage. These first two chapters are a monumental set of pillars in the revelation of God of himself. And so in chapter 1, we had basically this great praise for the grandeur of God's uh, great sovereign plan to redeem and purify and bless the elect through their union with Christ, those whom Paul said were chosen before the foundation of the world, that they had a destiny to be made holy, to be made uh, sons and daughters, heirs of God, that they're a part of something greater than themselves. This is a salvation that is authored by the Father and accomplished by the Son and applied by the Spirit, the whole Trinity working together for the exact same purpose. Also then, in chapter 1, as you go to the second half there, you find this prayer that Paul makes for the saints, that they would be encouraged and enlightened concerning the greatness of the power of God at work through Christ. You can see that there in the middle of it there in verse 18, having the eyes of our... Um, so that, or at the end of 17, that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and a revelation of the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards you, towards us who believe. 
according to the working of his great might. This fantastic prayer. And as the redeemed then, we are members of one people of God, the church, and therefore have a new identity in Christ, individually and corporately. That's what you see there sort of in then chapter 2 as well. In the beginning, we have this predicament of our sin. It's a pretty bleak picture. In fact, I can't think of a, a more bleak, a more hopeless picture in that we were dead in our sins. Not sick, not, not slightly debilitated, dead. Completely and utterly incapacitated in sin. Objects of wrath, and rightly so for our sin, and yet... By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, God comes to save the sinner and make him a son and daughter, make him an object of mercy. And then then in the second half of chapter 2, you see this also another predicament of our great separation from God and from others, especially these Gentiles, not a part of all that God had promised and planned and predicted and then made a part of one new body corporately, the people of God, God's incredible work of reconciliation. These two great big buts in the Bible. You were dead in sin, but God. And you were separated, but now. The work of God in redeeming and putting all things under the head, Jesus Christ, individually for us as sinners and corporately as a body. This is, this is the gospel. This is the work of reconciliation. This is the work of a new creation. This is something that we now learn is new. Not newly planned, not newly decided upon by God, but newly made known by God, as we heard Paul say. The others that came before you didn't know. They didn't understand. This was always God's plan. It's odd for Paul to say that certain things had been chosen by him before the foundation of the world, and yet... These are things that hadn't been revealed. They've been predicted but not understood. This is an amazing revelation of the power of God at work throughout all things. So we have for this reason. Now, secondly, I want you to notice that this is a bit of a divine rabbit trail. I don't know if we, were, as you, uh, if you recognize as we read through that, those first 13 verses, that we never really seem to get what it was for this reason. He, he sort of gets sidetracked. Right? I don't know if you've ever known anyone, especially a preacher, to ever get off on a side note or go on a tangent for any length of time. Seems odd to me. <laughs> I mean, that, that is what we do. We just get so consumed with things and we want to give this explanation or this backstory so that we can fully appreciate what's about to be said. This extra context. And you'll notice that there doesn't seem to be uh, anything in those first 13 verses that is what Paul does or says for this reason. But if you look down there in 14, you see he kind of comes back to it. He repeats, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom... And he, and he, he kind of, it's like, okay, I get it. You're going into prayer. So maybe for this reason, he's praying. And that's true. But in another sense, it's almost like another bit of context, another slight rabbit trail. Because then you get down there to, to the beginning of four. I therefore... A prisoner. So he repeats himself from the beginning of three. He started for this reason. I, Paul, a prisoner, and really that we'll get to this, but probably better rendered of Christ Jesus rather than for Christ Jesus. But he repeats it there at the beginning of chapter four. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you. In other words, and this is where Paul sort of makes Paul in chapter three is starting to round the corner from from doctrine and truth to okay practice. What do we do about? What do we do about that? And in chapter 4, as we talked way back at the beginning, the first three chapters are sort of this truth, really the core of it's in 1 and 2, and 3, he starts to round the corner, and in 4, 5, and 6, it is here's what you do with it. That's, that's often Paul's pattern. Here's the truth, here's the doctrine, and then here's what you do with it. Here's how you put that into practice. Here's how it informs your devotion and your worship and your practice of life. So Paul, in chapter 3, is starting to round the corner um, something got knocked over there. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing water on the floor underneath you, Robbie. I'll have to edit this out of the video. It's all right. Do we know where it's coming from? That's odd. 
Is it? It looks like it's dropping down out of the. It does. Is there something in the, in the, handle box? Oh. That's odd. Okay. All right. <laughs> Is it running along the bottom? Oh, that happens to me all the time. Your seat may get wet here pretty soon. <laughs> all right, no worries. As long as you find the source, right? <laughs> Where was I at? Um, <laughs> sorry. No, you're good. You're good. So Paul's pattern is to give you the truth and then tell you what to do with it. And three, he's starting to kind of round the corner. So we have a bit of a divine rabbit trail. I'm not going to say that this is not inspired. Of course it's inspired. It, it's recorded for us here in, in Scripture. And if you look at 14, we find that he's coming to this prayer. And then at the beginning of four, he's getting ready to tell us what to do with this. For this reason. For what reason? All the things that he's told us before. But look just for a second there. Um, at, at 16 through 19 there of chapter 3, this prayer that Paul's going to make that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What's Paul going to pray for? That you'd know the unknowable that you'd comprehend that thing which surpasses all knowledge. It's an odd thing to pray for, right? But there's no other way to get that knowledge other than to pray, to know what is not knowable, to know what man cannot know on his own. You hear Paul talk about that in Corinthians also, right? The wisdom of God is just, blows the wisdom of man out of the water, makes it look like stupidity, foolishness. And that's intentional on God's part that he would not be found by earthly means. He would not be arrived at through earthly wisdom. It is from himself. It is always about grace with God and his people. This rabbit trail then kind of concerns that which brings the knowledge and the power of God's sovereign eternal purposes. You see that there in the verses that we read in chapter 3. Um, through the Son, and by the Spirit, to his people. That is the gospel. The work and the plan and the purposes of God in the lives of his redeemed. Thirdly, then, you get to what Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul. So Paul here is an apostle. Albeit he grants one abnormally born. He wasn't one of the original 12. Nevertheless, he saw the resurrected Christ and was commissioned by the resurrected Christ. He is an apostle with a particular task. He is, if you like, one of these foundation stones he just told us about. And so he's establishing his perspective, his position, his priority as one of those foundation stones, as an apostle, as one who has received truth and revelation directly from God for the people of God and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Essentially, we hear where Paul is coming from. Paul's going to tell us what's going to motivate his prayer and, and what is informing his instructions to us as the apostle who will then in chapter 4 tell us what to do with these great and magnificent truths which he gave to us. Where are you coming from, Paul? I, Paul. And then he says that he's a prisoner, and as I said before, um, I think... More of the, the better translations I've seen all render this, even a different version of the ESV. I'm not sure which one this is. Um, for some reason, mine has changed to four, but almost every other version says of, which is we're going to find out, I think, I think is significant. But bear in mind where Paul was at. What, what circum, out of what circumstances is Paul writing this letter? And so he's imprisoned, okay? If you go back, and this is, this is your homework, I'm not going to take the time to go through all of this. It's a it's good to be reminded, but you, you need to do this. This will help, I think, as you meditate on God's word and on this sermon through the week, which I hope you're doing. Uh, this is Acts um, 21, basically all the way to the end. The things that happen in Acts 20 and 21 basically set the stage and start this ball rolling. And the last part of Acts, what you hear about is essentially Paul's journey. He gets in trouble <clears throat> for being accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple. 
And you remember there were signs posted in the temple. The Gentiles were not supposed to come or they were under penalty of death. They could lose their life for stepping foot in the temple. Now you see how scandalous it was that Paul was saying, <laughs> you are the temple, Jews and Gentiles alike. Now one new people of God, you are the temple of God. Anyway, Paul was accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple, which he didn't do, but he let him go through their whole charade. And these Jews who were just following him from one town to the next, trying to get him killed, he eventually gets arrested. And at very convenient times, with great patience, Paul will suddenly go to some Roman guard. Do you speak Greek? Or is it lawful for a Roman citizen to be whipped? To which the guard is like, whoa, hang on a second. <laughs> you know, I thought he was dealing with this Jewish thing going on. You're just a rabble rouser. Did, did you just say you were a, a Roman citizen? <sighs> no, now we're in trouble, right? We weren't dealing with you like we were supposed to be. We, we, we may have crossed a line here. And Paul essentially then ends up appealing to the highest court in the land. This situation then is a bit of a concurrence between God's sovereign purpose and plan for Paul, which he even told Paul about, and Paul's own actual individual choices to serve. Paul eventually appeals to Caesar. <laughs> Why would you do that? Why would you do that, Paul? If you just, if just for a, a glimpse here, if you if you go to Acts, um, I won't do the whole thing, but in Acts twenty. 22 and 23, you see Paul telling these Ephesian elders um, that, he, that he knows in some sense what's going to happen. I, and be, now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. I'm going, don't know exactly what's going to happen. I just know this, one, the Spirit's sending me, and two, I'm going to be imprisoned and I'm going to be afflicted. And boy, was he. He was, yet Paul is being obedient and he's being bold. The same thing he's going to tell us here in Ephesians 3, right? That God's going to make these known in verse 11 of Ephesians 3. Sorry, we're flipping back and forth. 3.11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Well, in Acts 26, right? So in Acts 20, you hear Paul saying, listen, this is what the Spirit's doing with me. It's where he's taking me. I'm going to go. But in Acts 26, where Paul is before King Agrippa, and there's a guy, there's a noble there named Festus, and Paul, Paul makes his defense. At one point, he gets to the end of this, and Agrippa says, Paul, you're out of your mind. All, because he, Paul kind of goes through the whole litany of redemptive history and his testimony and Agrippa says, man, all your learning, it's, it's driving you bonkers, Paul. And Paul goes, no, no, no. No, I, I'm telling you exactly what the gospel is. This is what's going on. And at one point in Acts 26, uh, you get to 31 and 32. So in 30, it says, Then the king arose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. This man, <laughs> all he had to do was keep his mouth shut. He didn't need to be here. He hasn't actually done anything wrong. But no, he's appealing to Caesar. Why? Because way back when he was in jail, and even at the beginning, Christ told Paul, you will testify before kings he'd been told in prison you are going to Rome he could have been set free right here he was in the lower courts he was in the appellate court he didn't need to go to Washington DC to the Supreme Court but he has to make his appeal God is at work doing his thing and Paul is being obedient making actual choices to serve not for his own ends because if Paul was out for his own ends He'd have just kept his mouth shut and he'd be free. No, no. These guys are like, man, he had to appeal to Caesar, so we got we to gotta do this now. They don't know what's going on. Paul knows what's going on. God certainly knows what's going on. And so it's believed that while he's in prison, sort of awaiting his big trial and his venue and all this business, 
At some point while he's in prison, that's when he writes Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, and Ephesians. This book is being written while he's in this imprisonment. So in a, in a way, we understand why he says that he's a prisoner. And that's the fourth thing. The three ways that Paul really identifies himself. He says he's a prisoner. You see that in verse 1. Also in verse 1 and in verse 7, maybe a little less explicit, you see that Paul views himself as a servant. You see that what he says he's doing, he's doing on behalf of you Gentiles. In verse 7, he says that he's a minister. That word for minister there is the word that we get our word deacon from. It's a word that means servant. It's a word that can mean um, like a, a table waiter. Diakonos, deacon. He's, he's a servant. He's a prisoner. He's serving others. And then also you see there in verse 2, he's a steward. He's a prisoner. He's a servant. He's a steward. All of these positions are filled by those who serve the purposes of someone greater. They are all subservient means to another's end. Every one of those identities is about being a subservient mean to the ends of something or someone greater. A prisoner, right? Paul often spoke about being a prisoner. He does it again in chapter 4 of Ephesians. He does it in chapter 6 of Ephesians. He calls himself an ambassador in chains. He told Timothy not to be ashamed of his chains. Twice in Philemon, he refers to himself as being a prisoner or in chains. And he certainly was in prison because of his bold proclamation of the gospel. You see that. Those, of Acts, those events in Acts 20 and following uh, bring Paul, this gospel preacher to the Gentiles, into imprisonment more than once. And he suffered incredible afflictions. He lists them once in, in what's called Paul's, if you get table talk, you know that this is kind of where we've been. In 2 Corinthians 11, this is Paul's fool's speech, where he's, he's going off about these false teachers that these Corinthians are all on about. And they are always trying to play Paul down because surely he can't be an apostle of God. Look at, all the, look at all the terrible trouble he's going through. Surely he's not actually an apostle. And at one point, Paul kind of relates to them in 2 Corinthians 11, all the things that he's been through for their sake. He says in verse 24, um, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. That was the life of an apostle. That was Paul's best life now. Paul knew affliction. He knew suffering. And what he suffered he suffered one had his own choice to be obedient to christ he chose imprisonment he knew that if he had not appealed to caesar they could do nothing to him but he chose to do it and at the same time he is experiencing this affliction at the hands of god who is using him for his own glory and this is what we must see. There is not a better cure or antidote for this narcissistic, self-centered, self-serving culture, especially within the church, who would like you to be convinced that all of God's blessings are for here and now so you can be healthy, wealthy, comfortable. You won't read about a life like that in any of these men. You won't see that in the pages of Scripture for those who chose to serve Christ. And you also won't find that these men were suffering at the hands of others absent of God's guiding hand and eternal purpose. And you won't find these men never finding joy 
what the world would sell you is what you deserve to be happy and to be all of these things. These men had genuine joy and they didn't need what this world had to offer. And they weren't going to lay down for the lie that they weren't really following Christ unless they had what this world calls the blessings of God. They were living for something greater than themselves. Paul understood that his life was not an end to the work of God. It was a means of the work of God. He's a prisoner. He's a servant. He's a steward. None of those positions are ends in and of themselves. And Paul rejoices. Philippians, this is all over the book of Philippians. In chapter 1 of Philippians, listen to some things that Paul says. I'm going to skip around a little bit here to hit the high points. I'm going to start in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, confident in the Lord. Yes, give me some of that. How? How do I get that by my imprisonment? Hang on. You see? Do you see how opposite? This this is so countercultural. This is the antithesis of so much of what you find in our culture, for sure, in a worldly sense, and even inside much of popular evangelicalism. This is a completely opposite story. How are we going to be confident in the Lord? How are these people emboldened? Because Paul was in prison. Because he suffered these things for Christ. And most of the brothers, having having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You get to verse 18. Paul says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Listen, some people are doing this in shady ways and others not. I don't care. Christ is being preached. That's the end. That's the goal. Christ is being preached. It's not me. It's not, okay, beat me, flog me, stone me, leave me in the ocean, imprison me. I don't care. I'm a means. I'm a means to an end. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Proclaim Christ. Verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which shall I choose? I cannot tell, right? He understands. understands. He's still living in a real world. Then you get to 29. Paul has this great statement. For it has been granted to you. That's grace, right? This is a giving of God, right? It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him. Don't miss that, by the way. To believe in Christ is something that God grants. It has been granted to you not just to believe. What else? But what else, God? What else is in the bag waiting? But also to suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had. And now here I still have. God's God's got a great plan for your life. Tell me about yours, Paul. Beaten. Beaten stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, put in prison. You won't find that in many bestsellers. You won't find that in the checkout line at Hobby Lobby. That is the testimony of Scripture. We are not the ends of the gospel. We are means for the building of the kingdom of God. God's glory is the end. Of all things. In actual fact, I I believe that he considered himself less a prisoner of man and more a prisoner of God. Remember? Do you remember Paul's first arrest? It was on the road to Damascus. When the great warden, if you like, of all the sheep, came and blinded him and put him on his face and said, You're not, you're mine now. You belong to me, and here's what I'm going to do with you. We think, oh gosh, that seems harsh. He's God. He's the king. Paul was headed for hell and it was Christ the king who came to him and captured him. Captured him. There, there's, a, there's a scripture and I used to do the same thing and it's not any less significant, but 2 Corinthians 2, people appeal to this all the time and I think many of them, maybe not all, but some of them I think they do it wrongly. 
2 Corinthians 2, 14 says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Paul's not saying that we are co-conquerors marching in with the leader, marching with Christ. We are those who are marching and being led by Christ. Well, who was it that these leaders used to march into town leading? It was the captives. Those they had captured when they went and won their victory were falling in line behind them in the parade. The spoils of the victory of the king and Paul is saying we are led in this triumphal procession, not as co-conquerors, but as the captives of the great captor, Jesus Christ. He was a prisoner, not just for the sake of Christ, but he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was captive by Christ. What liberty and freedom there is to be held captive by Christ and not by sin. We are held captive by Christ. The image of Paul as a prisoner, also as a servant, mentioned to you on behalf of you Gentiles. And then in verse 7, where he says, I'm a minister. You could look at Romans 1, 1, Romans 6, 1 Corinthians 7, all of these places. Titus, well, Paul refers to himself as a servant, or depending on your translation, it may even render it slave or bond servant. Even there in Ephesians again, in chapter 6, verse 6. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. God's will, God's sovereign plan, God's purpose, my obedience from my own heart, which God has given me. Which is why in the New Covenant, incidentally, God says, I am going to write my law on their heart. It's not that I'm doing away with the law. I'm going to give them a new heart and they're going to want what I want. And so Paul is a prisoner. He is a servant. What Paul did in obedience to Christ, he did for others on behalf of their good. On your behalf, Gentiles, I'm doing these things, which also ties into the third thing, which is being a steward. Being a steward. Emphasis then of stewardship is on utilizing that which is entrusted to a servant by a master. Using that which does not belong for you to you for the good of the master. Again, I'm reminded of, of 2 Corinthians 4, where we hear about these clay pots and this treasure that we have in these clay pots. And in verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 4, Paul writes, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. I'm a steward. What I'm doing, I'm doing for you for the glory of God. We get an even better picture of this in the other one of Paul's prison epistles, Colossians, in the first chapter where he writes in verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister, that is again a servant, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. You see this concurrence of the great sovereign plan and purpose of God, a theme introduced by God heavily in the first two chapters of Ephesians. And now we're getting into how we live this out. And Paul here is sort of massaging these two together. Yes, God does have a great sovereign, perfect plan. And it includes you and it incorporates you. And yes, you have choices to make in obedience and in accordance with that plan. That's why he's made it known to you. That's why he's made it known. Paul laid everything on the line for the gospel something he believed was the power of God unto salvation. He's a prisoner. He's a servant. He's a steward. You know, what was his name before? It was Saul. Saul takes us back to the first king of Israel, who was known 
among other things, for his great stature. Paul means little or small. Saul, this great big name. And what does God give him as a new name? Little, small. And he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. I'm a servant for you. I'm a steward of what God has and he's doing these things. I'm doing these things on your behalf. He viewed his life as a means, not an end. Our lives are means for God's end and for his glory. We see that in Philippians 3, don't we? Verse 7, Paul writes, But whatever gain I had, I counted it as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Doesn't matter what God has planned for me, even if that is through the path of suffering. That is the path to what God has promised to me, a resurrection from the dead, because I have a righteousness that is not of my own. It is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so I will go. And I'm fine to lose everything. He's glorified in the building of his kingdom. Our inclusion in his kingdom is the ultimate rest and blessing for all his subjects, for all who are made sons and daughters and heirs through Christ. Isn't that what the Westminster Shorter Confession's first question once emphasized at the outset? What is the chief end of man? Why did God make you? To glorify him and enjoy him forever. See, being captive to God is not about being beaten down. No, it's the greatest freedom, the greatest blessing, the greatest pleasure. It's just not this world's blessing and pleasure. It's this fleetingness. Paul's saying, all this just rubbish. It's dung. I'm done with all of it. I'll give all of it up. But for the sake of knowing Christ, I'm a means for the gospel to others, not an end unto myself. So I'll leave you with Paul's words again from Ephesians. As I ask you this question in closing, what ends are you living for? Are you living, serving and capturing and using what? Who is serving and using whom? Do we use God for our ends or are we being used by God for his ends? Always that is true, but where is our mind at? It's countercultural. Won't be popular, won't be easy. Listen to Paul's words now as we close from Philippians 1, heading into 2. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but your salvation, and that from God. For it had been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for conflict that I saw, that you saw I had, and now I still have. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Amen.